Testing, testing. Testing. Hello there. <laughs> All right. Well, I suppose you're wondering why we called you here today. <laughs> Introductions. Introductions. <laughs> okay, I, I'm I'm R. J. Michael. I was one of the uh, original team that put the Amiga computer together 30 years ago. Wow, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. <laughs> I'm Dave Haney. I'm not original. <laughs> I did a lot of follow-up work at Commodore. <laughs> And uh, you might remember the A2000, the A3000, little bits of the A4000, and the thing that preceded it that you never got. <laughs> um, and uh, we're here to chat with you about something. We have, we we just met, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have one thing that I want okay. to say before we uh, I let okay. Dave do some talking here. I just I want to thank all of you for oh. being here. This once again, I, this is this is a, the the fourth event this year that I've gone to about the Amiga, and the thing that I'm finding that I'm loving the most about these events is getting a chance to to meet you people that so many years ago you were the people we were trying to find. You were the people that we were trying to create a machine for. That, that would help define your life, would help you discover yourself, your own talents. And, and I've, I've heard so many stories about how, how you got into the career, you got into, into the profession that you pursued, the thing that you ended up loving to do with your life because of that machine that we built. And, and the part that you may not recognize well enough is that this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to reach into your soul and, and help you find yourself and make yourself a better version of who you are. And, and to, to be in a setting like this where, where I get to now finally meet so many of you, this is like heaven for me. I'm ecstatic at this moment and I couldn't be happier. And so I'm going to stop talking now, but afterwards, please come find me and <laughs> let me shake your hand because I want to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and RJ, RJ just said a lot of what I wanted to start out with because, you know, it's, it, you know, it, if, if you look in your pocket at your smartphone and maybe that's a year or two old or something and you look at, you look at how old your, your other electronics are, in my business designing electronics, it's completely 100% unreasonable to think that somebody would still be using your product two or three years later, much less 20 or 30 years later. Um, you guys have kept this alive longer than I could have possibly hoped. So I thank you. <laughs> and, and that's also something that it even took me a little while to realize that, you know, the Amiga community was really strong. You know, I had, I had quoted that, that um, you know, that Amiga people were so passionate they made Macintosh users look like PC users. <laughs> um, but, you know, really, I mean, you know, we, we sat around for years waiting to see who was going to rescue Commodore. And nobody was going to rescue Commodore. And who was going to rescue Amiga? Um, the community rescued Amiga. Um, you, know, you know, I got into Commodore in kind of a weird way. I was working for a large company I didn't like. They were doing things I didn't like. Um, I was right out of college and I was going to work every day and with but the, it was the largest, the largest hiring this company had done in years and they were bringing in all these college students but one by one the college students were disappearing as they were getting assimilated by the Borg or something like that and I didn't want to be that person I, I eventually got up the, the, the stones to send out my resume to the one company in, that listed in the local newspaper that wasn't saying you need two or three years of experience because I hadn't had it. Um, that was on a Tuesday. On a Thursday, I get called in to go see this, this 
headhunter, as we call them, the recruiter, uh, in Philadelphia where I was working. I happened to be wearing a homemade shirt that day. <laughs> and I walked in, and there was this John Lennon looking guy sitting in the, in the lobby. Long hair, long hair, circular glasses. He, like, you here for an interview? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you? And I'm, he's like, yeah, sort of. And we got to talking, and had, we had a good old time talking there until the suit guy came in and said, okay, come, come talk to me. And I went to talk to the suit guy. And he was from Commodore, and I didn't, nobody tells you ahead of time who, was gonna, who you're going to be interviewing with. And it's like, oh, I know Commodore. That's a good company. My, I, the, the, second, the first personal computer I ever programmed was a pet computer um, back in 1977. So um, I was, that, was, that was a good sign. I went to, uh, I went to the inter that interview, went to the next room, and there's that John Lennon looking guy. That was Bill Hurd. And uh, <clears throat> he brought me in and said, oh, we've already met. And, and he, he later told me years later, oh, you were hired when I met you in the lobby. <laughs> the rest of it was just formalisms. And um, so I went to work on the 8-bit computers that Commodore was making. But well into my very first real project and on the Commodore 128, when I really felt like I was contributing as being a good engineer, doing all this neat stuff, we got these green books in. The green books came from this company called Amiga that we had just bought. And we didn't know that much about it. And then there were some mysterious black boxes floating around the, the room. And I went and um, the green books were not something that you were supposed to be able to take home. They were very carefully guarded. Bill Hurd got a green book. I was there late, like midnight, one in the morning one time, and I said, I want my own green book. So I took Bill Hurd's book and photocopied that sucker, brought it home. <clears throat> Over that next weekend, I read everything there was at the time about Amigas, decided that's really what I wanted to be doing. Um, before I even had it, like, when the C128 came out and, I, and, and the, a couple months before the A1000 came out, um, I was getting a little bit of a reputation for being online because I, I sort of learned really early on that if you could meet the people who are using your computer, it would improve your life in many, many different ways. Like maybe the next computer will be better. I'll understand what people do with it better. I it was reaching out. We, back then we were all using code names because we, we were all worried that people were going to be calling Commodore and asking for us and we'd get in trouble. <laughs> but um, that started on things like Quantum Link and CompuServe. And I sort of felt a little bad because very early on in the, in the C128 era, I was switching over to the A1000 I had just bought. <laughs> and uh, it was only a couple years, it was, it was like less than a year later. It was, that was end of 85. <laughs> In 86, Commodore started working on the A500, and I got invited to go and join that group, because really, I tried everything I could to make more 8-bit computers. Nobody wanted them. Um, there was a Commodore 256. There are actually two different ones. Uh, only one of them actually had 256, but there, there, was, there was a project going, but it was, it was, no, there was no demand for it. I wanted to work on the Amiga, and um, uh, eventually I did. I was on the on the, on the, on the Amiga 500 for one month. Then uh, George Robbins, who, in, who, who had started the A500, said I, I, he was supposed to go and make the A2000, but he didn't want to. He's like, this is mine. I want to stay with it. So I, at age 23 or tw so, got put on the one guy on the A2000 in Westchester. And from there, I, you know, I just I embraced it. I did everything I could. I, I read books at night. I stayed up late. I figured out how to get the frickin' Zorro bus to work on a two-layer board, <laughs> and it was uh, it was it was the best times because it was because you were always going to work. Like you'd wake up in the morning. I'm like I'm excited to be driving into work. It wasn't like a lot of you know. It wasn't. It was one of those things. I guess there's a saying that says, "Do what you love, and you will never work a day in your life." <laughs> you know that excited to get into work thing. <laughs> we, I, we, I've done a lot of technology over the years. I've been involved in a lot of projects since the Amiga, but the Amiga 
was by far and away the most passionate undertaking that I've had in my career. We were, we were more than employees. We were more than, than mere believers in, in a dream. We were, we, we were believers in a religion. We were on a mission to change the world. We really believed that we would have the kind of effect that it seems to have had on so many people. And here's a little known story about the Amiga. When we were developing it, we had these, uh, these the chips, the big three chips in the Amiga were done up originally in, in high-speed CMOS. It's a complicated story, but they were these, they, they looked like mini Cray computers. Each chip had a, a bunch of boards and a lot of parts on it. And it was extremely delicate electronic hardware. If, if it took a static hit, it burn out half of one of these boards and, and they would have to spend days replacing all the parts and figuring out what was broken. So we needed to make sure that anyone who got anywhere near the board was not, uh, didn't have static electricity. So we had this mat on the floor called an anti-stat mat that when you would step on it, it would discharge the static electricity from your body. And we, had a, we made a corridor out of chairs, so if you wanted to get to the hardware, you had to go up this corridor and, and step on this mat. So we had this channel that you would walk through. Now meanwhile, the hardware was in the software lab, so all the software guys could do the development. And, and the cables went from the hardware and they went across and draped out to all of the room to connect to our development boxes. But they draped right over this walkway that you had to go through. So when you would approach the Amiga hardware, you had to go up this channel, this corridor, and you had to duck under the cable. So it was like you're bowing. Every time you came up to the Amiga, you would bow. <laughs> And, you know, and at the time, we, we didn't think of it in, in any sort of with religious overtones, but now looking back on it, I wonder a little bit, you know? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so I have, I have a, uh, as, as many people might know, the original Omega 2000 was developed in Braunschweig. And I, 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 what I did was I took the, the, that idea and applied the A500 chips to it and added some stuff like the video slot all the way so that you could put a, to well, we don't know about toasters yet, but it, that's what made toasters possible. And, and the CPU slot was done a little differently so you could just plug a CPU in. But the, the, the main reason that the, that the A2000 had been done in Germany was that um, Henry Rubin, who was the VP of engineering at that time, wanted this thing called the bridge card. Because they, the A1000 had the sidecar, but he wanted the bridge card, so you could put a PC in your Amiga. And the bridge card came out, and it was not all that successful, but some people liked it. And, but Henry all loved the bridge card. So I'm working on the early days of the Amiga 3000, and I designed the Buster chip. That's the thing that runs the, the Zorro bus. And of course, I had this whole Zorro 3 bus that sort of overlaid the Zorro 2 bus. And almost everything worked. Or occasionally, th things didn't work. So, so like a third party company would send me the card, and I'm like, oh, and you sent me the PAL equations. This PAL is wrong. And a couple cases, I was actually able to reprogram the PAL and fix it without changing their board at all. So sometimes I made some mistakes on Zorro. But the, the bridge card was not working, and that was not good with Henry. So one day, I was really, I'd, I'd spent the whole day working on the bridge card, and I couldn't get it to work. And Henry's like, we, we must summon the Germans. So he, so he's, he's um, I had to leave early that day because I was getting a root canal in one of my teeth. And um, Henry proceeded to summon the Germans. Actually, I guess that morning he had summoned the Germans. They were coming, and I was really trying to get it done before they arrived. So the Germans were coming, and we, we, had, you know, we had a real engineering team in Braunschweig, and we had a real engineering team in Japan, but it was mostly in the United States, in Westchester. So um, while, while, while the people from Braunschweig were coming, I went home. I was driving home in my little sports car, going about 90 miles per hour, and I suddenly realized I know what's wrong with the bridge card. And I went and got my root canal and drove back to Commodore. 
And I got there kind of late-ish, and the Germans had been there, said hi to Henry, and went out for dinner, and they were going to come back. Um, I sat down at my, my little workstation and, and took out my soldering iron, made a couple little changes to the bridge card. It could have fixed it on the motherboard, but it was, I just put it on the bridge card. It was just a little hack, and plugged it in, and sure enough, MS-DOS booted up, and I wrote this little script that said, the bridge card's working, and left it running in a continuous loop, and went home. And, of course, nobody knew that I had been there. <laughs> so, the, the Germans come back from dinner and meet with Henry and go to look at the A2000 that I had, the A3000 I had set up, and see this thing scrolling over and over again, and they were dumbfounded, and, and Henry was dumbfounded, and um, I came in late the next morning, because it was pretty late by the time I got home, and you know, I was like, oh yeah, I came back last night and fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> it also tells you something about when you get stuck, just go in a car, blast some really loud rock music, and drive fast, and you'll probably, the answer will just come to you. <laughs> yeah, when you get stuck, go get a root canal job. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> I, I too was uh, involved with this uh, the the effort to get a PC running on an Amiga, and that project worked. And and you could have a PC window open up on your Amiga. And having the window open made our bosses very happy, but we were most satisfied when we closed that window. <laughs> So we're out of time, my friend. That's we're it. out of time. Yep, that's it. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess you'll have to come and talk to us individually. Yeah, we'll be hanging around. <laughs> Please come find us. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>